I'm using for a subject this morning, the world's greatest love story. The world's greatest love story. The text comes from our Lord's Gospel according to John, the third chapter and verse 16. Gospel of John, third chapter, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, everywhere we turn today, we see tragedies. And most of what we hear is bad news. Well, I've come to bring you some good news in the midst of this bad news. You know, this is a sadly sick society. People think that they can find peace of mind in pills. They're trying to eat their way to ecstasy. They're trying to drink their way to pleasure. They're trying to smoke their way to settle nerves and puff their way to popularity and push their way to power. Bully their way to friendship and bum their way to world peace. But I know where a poor man has a chance, where a sick man can get well. An ignorant man can become wise. A bad man can be made good. A good man can be made better, and even a dead man can be made alive in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, should not have, should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's no other passage in all of the Bible that says so much to so many in so few words. Now here we have a volume in a verse, an ocean in a dewdrop, and a continent in a cup. Here we have the world's greatest love story. It's even the anthem of redemption. You see, you start out saying it and you wind up singing it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As someone has said, it's too fair to touch, it's too good to be true, and it's too far away to be real. And the cynics are asking, is it so? If it is so, so what? Well, I've come to say that it is so. This phenomenon is beyond the kin of human comprehension. Frederick Faber, in his familiar hymn, said, For the love of God is broader than the measure of a man's mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. God's love is real. It had no beginning and will have no end. It cannot change because God cannot change. God cannot change for the better, and he can't change for the worse. He can't change for the better because he's the very embodiment of excellence himself. And he can't change for the worse because he has nothing in his power or will to hurt himself. So we just join with the writer of the Hebrews in saying he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is real. His love is everlasting. God does not love us because we are lovely or lovable. His love does not exist on account of our, our character, but on account of His. God does not love us because we are valuable, but we are valuable because God loves us. God does not love us because Jesus died for us. But Jesus died for us because God loves us. His love is stronger than sin, it's deeper than sorrow, and it's mightier than death. 
Yes, I said, this is not only the world's greatest love story, but it's the anthem of redemption. And this music is written in the key of B. Be saved. And in this music, there are four movements. Movement number one gives us the cause of salvation. If you really want to know the cause of salvation, it's for God so loved the world. Movement number two gives us the cost of salvation. Now, salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It doesn't cost the, any, the sinner anything, but it costs God his only begotten son. Movement number three gives us the condition of salvation that whosoever believeth in him. And then movement number four gives us the consequences of salvation. And here you have a double promise. One should not perish, and two shall have everlasting life. Oh, there's just so much in this text until uh, one scarcely knows how to approach it. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about two nouns and two verbs and quit. You know, the two nouns are God and world. And the two verbs are loved and gave. You know, men have some weird concepts of God. Some have a Lone Ranger concept. They think that God is standing around ready to hop into our lives only when we need Him. And then some have a granddaddy concept of God. They refer to Him as the old man upstairs. They think that He's having trouble with His legs and He's not able to get down to see about us often. And then some have a philosophical concept of God. Uh, they say that God is man's problem, and man is going to have to solve his problem. And then you remember back during the 60s, the offbeat theologians romped around in their subsurface playpens and emerged and announced that God was dead. Now that shouldn't have been surprising to us because the Bible has informed us that the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. And when I first heard that absurd statement, it made me want to ask some stupid and senseless questions like, who assassinated God? What coroner was called? And who signed his death certificate? And who was so well acquainted with the one pronounced dead that he could identify the deceased? In what obituary column did you find his name? And why was I not notified? I'm a member of the family. God is spirit. He does not die by assassination. He does not die by pronouncement. He does not die by denial. He just does not die. He's as real today as he was to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you'll trust him, he will be as true to you as he was to Abram when Abram was called to go out not knowing whether he went. If you'll trust him, he will be as evident to you as he was to Moses when God manifested himself in a burning bush. Now, when they couldn't get anywhere with the God is dead idea, now in these 70s, one of the top theological questions is, where did God come from? Now, the primary purpose of God in creation was to prepare a moral being spiritual and intellectually capable of worshiping him. When heaven and earth were yet unmade, when there was empty blackness and void formlessness, and darkness was on the face of the deep, when time was yet unknown, thou in thy bliss and majesty did live and love alone. He called light out of darkness. He called cosmos out of chaos. He called order out of confusion. But the question still clamors for an answer. Where did God come from? The answer is he came from nowhere. Now that's theologically correct and it's biblically sound. 
for her Beckett said, I saw him when he left the hills of Keman, the Holy One from Mount Perrin. And Keman simply means nothing or nowhere. So he came from nowhere. I made that statement in Detroit some time ago, and a man talked with me after the meeting, and he said, Preacher, let's be reasonable about this thing. You were up there tonight talking about God came from nowhere. So let's be reasonable. I said, all right. If you just want to be reasonable about it, the reason God came from nowhere, there wasn't anywhere for him to come from. And coming from nowhere, he stood on nothing. And the reason he had to stand on nothing, there was nowhere for him to stand. And stand on nothing, he reached out where there was nowhere to reach and caught something when there was nothing to catch and hung something on nothing and told it to stay there. Now you'll find that in Job 26 and 7 that he hung this world on nothing. And standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will and he struck the anvil of his omnipotence and sparks flew therefrom. And he caught them on the tips of his fingers and flung them out into space and bedecked the heavens with stars. And nobody said a word. The reason nobody said anything, there wasn't anybody there to say anything. So God himself said, that's good. <laughs> and God so loved the world. The world, all that God made everything and everybody he made it and he loves it god loves every human being it doesn't matter who you are where you came from how long you've been in sin god loves you no individual can go out of here saying no one loves you god loves you he so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now these two verbs, loved and gave, work together inevitably and invariably.